You know, over the past couple of weeks, we have been looking at this juxtaposition, right, between this way that Jesus has been declaring to us, and then also about uh, sometimes how that doesn't really align with some of our own thinking, our own patterns of behavior. And what Jesus is doing is constantly coming and re reminding us again of this way, of this truth, and causing us to kind of reflect a bit and make sure that our, our lives are walking in harmony with his. So we put together this series called The Verdict because at the end of each one of these passages, I hope that we walk away thinking a little bit more deeply about what it is that Jesus is calling us to be and to do. Um, over the past couple of weeks, we've had this opportunity to take a look at a, a number of passages. Uh, some that saw Jesus in a different light, very forceful, you know, uh, pointing out the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his day. And then as Jesus leaves that temple and uh, mounts the uh, Mount of Olives, there he is in this tone of deep reflection about what is going to happen. And almost with a very burdened heart, he begins to reveal to them what the days ahead are going to hold in store for his followers. He talks about this great conflict that's gonna happen. There's gonna be all kinds of deception. There's gonna be wars and rumors of wars. There's gonna be natural disasters. There's, there's gonna come a point where it says that, that wickedness is so going to increase that the love of many will grow cold. And the bottom line for Jesus is that despite all these things are happening, it's not that the world, um, well, it's not that things are falling apart, it's that things are falling into place. Jesus has a plan, it's not a pleasant one, it's gonna unfold and it's gonna mean um, a great deal of discomfort for his followers in this period of time. But it's all working out in real space, in real time, and Jesus is saying all of this is gonna culminate in the destruction of the temple and everything that is associated with that. I mean, it would be, the, it's the centerpiece of Jewish life, and now it's gonna be gone. All the sacrifices, all of you know, the feast days, everything where people would come and gather, now it's, it's going to be obliterated. Rome is going to come in AD 70 in the War of Masada, and there's not gonna be one stone that's gonna lie on top of another. So, Having tell them, told them that, he's, he gets to the point, it says that you and I need to be ready for those days. We need to be prepared, we need to be vigilant. And then, last week, if you were with us, Jesus almost seems to have stopped and said, okay, listen, let me, let me get very specific here because I really want you to heed this challenge to be ready. And what he says is, look, I, I, uh, the hour and the day, no one knows, not the angels, not, not, not me, the son, but only the father. And he begins then to give us reasons why we should take him seriously when he says, I want you to be ready. I want you to be vigilant for these days that are coming so that you don't fall away, but that you persevere until the end. And it had everything to do with the fact that the Father is the one who has set this date, and so it's going to happen exactly as he has prescribed. That discipleship um, is such that it puts a demand on our lives that we are to be faithful, even to the end, in the midst of all the conflicting stories that are happening all around us. And that your future is gonna depend on it, because he ended our, our time last week by sharing with his disciples about those wise and faithful servants who were busy about his father's business over against the foolish servant who only had his own agenda and it was not in concert with, with his father's. And there was great loss that came as a result of that. But today, there's another nuance that I want you to capture as we begin to look at this passage. And it has everything to do with the coming of Christ, but dealing with the weight. And I'm not talking weight as in heaviness, but as weight as in time. <laughs> like, Jesus uttered these words 2,000 years ago. 
And if we're not careful, we become exasperated thinking, oh my gosh, like why is this happening still? I'd love to turn the page. I, I, I'd love for him to come back and all those promises of heaven and restoration and redemption. I, I'd, I'd like that now, please. But we're in this process of waiting. And the world seems to be deteriorating before our very eyes, right? So this idea of wait is what is at, uh, is at the center of this story that Jesus is going to tell. And so I, I'd like to read that to you. It's found in uh, Matthew chapter 25. And uh, it's the first 13 verses. It says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. Virgins were ready, uh, who were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Jesus ends again with this challenge to make sure that we are watchful, that we are prepared, because it can come suddenly, unexpectedly. But one of the things that um, I kind of teased out in our uh, Seize the Days that we've uh, had together uh, this past week is the idea that God's time schedule and ours are very different. There's a passage that uh, I refer to in 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord, and a day could be like a thousand years, right? A thousand years like a day, a day could be like a thousand years. And, um, and so you get, to, you get this sense that God's time is not our time. And um, it could lead to a great deal of frustration. And um, isn't that one of the hardest things about sometimes it, when, you, when you're praying and you're seeking God's will, that um, you have to wait <laughs> for an answer. I, I, I'd rather have a no. I Me mean, personally, I mean, I'd rather just God just turn around and say, nope, that's not gonna happen. I mean, I like it but I kind of take a deep breath and I just have to go on with my life. But when he says, wait, oh man, like how long, when? And suddenly you feel like you're a kid, you know, with parents on vacation, right? Where it's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so here's this passage now that Jesus tells a story. You know what the problem is sometimes with stories like this? We live in 2023, and you open up a story like this, and it just seems like it's foreign to our experience. So if we're going to draw any meaningful conclusions from this text that we're reading, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to climb this ladder of abstraction so that we can begin to speak about issues that concern us even in the day in which we're living. And so what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a framework for the story that is before us. And, um, and hopefully uh, you'd leave a little bit more challenged to live out this, this uh, walk of faith. 
We're given this setting. So let me, let me remind you now a little bit about what we have just read. He says here, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins. Well, at that time refers to Jesus's second coming. He had just finished talking in all of chapter 23, preparing them for the day that is, that is still to come, making sure that they understand that that day rests in the mind of God. And so it's going to happen so that we ought to heed the challenge to be ready. But he's saying at that day, right, at that time, it, and speaking about when he's coming, it's, it's he's saying, look, you got to make sure that your focus is on the right things. So when that day comes, you're going to be ready. And so he says, let me tell you what this kingdom of heaven really is going to be about. And so he uses this illustration of these 10 virgins, five foolish, five wise. The word here that's translated for virgin really just refers to a woman who is unmarried, but of marriageable age. The equivalent in our day would be kind of maybe like a, a, a bride's bridesmaids. Um, my wife informed me when I was going through this sermon that she said, you know, before we got married, I was in 13 weddings. <laughs> I had 13 dresses. I was the most popular girl in, in, uh, in the community with all the high school kids because I was giving them away all these dresses that they needed for proms and stuff. And um, I quickly reminded her that I kind of saved her from being an old maid, but she, uh, she didn't really want to hear that. But the idea here is to, ser- to, to share that they are all about the happiness of the bride and now this union with the groom. Their whole reason to be there is kind of like bridesmaids in a, med- in a wedding now. And, 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 the, uh, and the support that they give to their friend who is gonna be married. There was processions that took place in this culture. And so the, the idea of these torches that they would have they, they, uh, they were for, the, for that very kind of pageantry. Well, you notice here though that they're divided between foolish and wise. Can you remember any other time that you heard that kind of distinction between foolish and wise in the teachings of Jesus leading up to this point? This is the same exact words that he used before. How about this? Remember when Jesus said, wise is the man who builds his house upon a rock, right? Foolish is that man who builds his house upon the sand. He says, the one who builds his house on a rock, it says, when the rain falls and the winds blow and the floods rise and beat against his house, his house will stand because it was built on the rock. If you built your house on sand, you were foolish. Because when that rain came down and the floods rose and the winds beat against that house, it was gonna leave devastation everywhere. When I ever teach that passage, I always like to ask people, okay, what is the rock that the wise man is building on? And usually the answer, people turn around and say, well, it's Jesus. (laughs) I'm like, no. And they're like, what? It's gotta be Jesus. And I go, no, it's not. And then they say, oh, well, I know what it is. It's the word of God. And I go, no, it's not the word of God either. And they're like, whoa, man, it's not Jesus. It's not the word. Well, what is it? And I said, well, look at the passage. Jesus says, he who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who builds his house on a rock. That rock is a rock of obedience because the fool was defined by the fool who hears these words, but doesn't put them into practice. Why would you be given this wisdom and choose to ignore it? 
to your own detriment. See, that's what's happening in this passage. There is these the, these uh, handmaidens here now who are to be a part of this whole procession, their role is to perform a certain function. And so you find here that there are wise maids and foolish ones. And the foolish and the difference between the two seem to be who is the most prepared. They were assigned the task of meeting the bridegroom with the bride at the proper time and then in procession usher them into this great big wedding feast. That was their job. But um, they came unprepared. And so one had oil, the other had none. Now, just so we understand how what Jesus is doing with this parable, the idea of this bridegroom, very often in the in the uh, in the Old Testament, a bridegroom is is frequently pictured as God Himself. There are numerous places in the Old Testament where God takes on this role as the bridegroom that comes to His bride talking about his relationship with his people and the sense of intimacy between the two of them. In fact, Jesus would use that of himself. One day he was arguing with the Pharisees over some of the the minor um, uh, details of the law. And, um, And then Jesus would tell them this parable about this coming wedding feast. And he says, um, the, the Pharisees had, had, uh, had asked Jesus why, um, in particular, why his disciples were not washing their hands before they ate. And that uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, in keeping with their regulations. And then Jesus said this, he says, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. This whole idea of fasting, when they're in the presence of the bridegroom, to Jesus seem inconsistent. What he is saying in this text is that he is that bridegroom. He is the Messiah that now has come to his people. That this was a period of time now where God, through Jesus, was revealing his will and purposes both in his words and through his actions. And so, notice what happens in the story. It says that the bridegroom was long, was a long time in coming. And everybody became drowsy and fell asleep. So what happens when you're waiting for a long time? It just, you lose the sense of time, and if you're not careful, you lose your sense of focus, right? And they fall asleep. Both the fool, the foolish maidens and the wise ones. Then around midnight, when they least expect it, this cry rings out and they say, hey, the bridegroom is on his way, so come out and let's meet him. It's time to fulfill their function. You gotta get lined up. It's like a processional, like when you have weddings. Everybody has to be in their spot. Everybody's assigned a seat. I've done numerous weddings in my, in my 40 years of ministry, and it's always interesting that everybody gets nervous. Where do I stand? What do I do? And I'm like, okay, well, who's got the rings? They had this job. They waited, it was a long time coming, but the time came and when it did, they weren't ready, at least five of them. Interesting thing though, a lamp back in this day, there are a couple of different words that you can use, but the word that's used for this lamp is not like a lamp that you set on a table that you light the wick, right, and it gives, it illumines the whole room. No, this was a lamp that was more like a torch. You took, 
you know, strips of cloth and you wrapped them around and you would dip them in this oil and you would light it and you would use it now as, uh, as this light that you could, obviously here in our text, right? They're, they're carrying this out. And so what do you think the lighting time on one of those little torches were? Like how long do you think it would stay lit? Some commentators here are saying that the, 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 the oil, the way the things were wrapped, you'd probably get no more than about 20 minutes out of one of those torches, which is why you had to bring extra oil because you would have to replenish the fuel so that you would have light. That's why in the story, Jesus is making a point that the wise maidens were the ones that came fully prepared. And I love the way this one um, commentator, you know, uh, said, he said, think about this. The jars, he said, held oil in which the, the torch was dipped before lighting. But what good is a torch without a jar of oil? It's as useless as a flashlight without batteries. That's what we're talking about here. Why are you going to go out? You're responsible for bringing the light and you go out with a flashlight and you don't have any batteries. You are totally unprepared for what you are being asked to do. And so as the story begins to develop, now you begin to see that it's midnight, unexpected. But who's prepared? The ones that brought the oil, right? And the other ones are, so, are shown to be foolish. So you just mark it up and say, well, maybe this is just another call to just be ready. But it's not just a call to be ready because it was a long time before this, this uh, groom came. People got tired of waiting. They all fell asleep. But there's nothing in the text that seems that anybody's angry about the fact that they fell asleep. It just seems that the point of criticism has to deal with the fact that they weren't, they weren't ready, they weren't prepared when the time came and they were needed. And so this whole crisis could have been avoided, which is the point. They found themselves now at a loss, but it was a loss of their own doing. That's why in, in verse seven of Matthew 25, it says, when all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps. Remember I said, it was only a short period of time that those things would stay lit. And the foolish ones then said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. And the reply was, no, there's not enough for you and us. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Man, that's, um, that seems a little harsh, don't you think? But if it's true that they only had enough to fulfill their responsibilities, if I gave you oil, I, I wouldn't have any, and then neither one of us is going to fulfill the role that we were being asked to do. But remember, this whole, this whole story isn't just about a wedding. This whole story is about the second coming of Jesus. The whole story is set about the kingdom of heaven. And it's likened using the metaphor of a wedding and its whole procession. But what we're really talking about is the coming of Christ, when he comes again, that seems to be delayed. And everyone's getting tired. But when the time came, the wise ones were the ones who seemed to be prepared. And now they are not the ones who are having to deal, excuse me, with the consequence here. Notice the foolish ones here, they were not only not in a position to fulfill their role, they couldn't put into practice their task. So they were superfluous, like what are you doing here then? Think about this. 
in a sense, they were pretending to be something that they were not. They were acting like they were part of this wedding processional, but their actions were saying, I don't really take it that seriously because I'm not even adding anything to this festivity. And so why, why do you think he's saying to them, why do you think in the story it says, no, there may not be enough? Seems to be pretty hard-nosed, right? But again, if this whole thing is about the second coming of Christ, if all of this is a picture of what's going to happen at the end of the age, then maybe what's being reflected here is that somebody, somebody else cannot provide for you what you need to be bringing. Somebody else is not gonna bail you out. You, you have to make preparation for yourself. Everybody has to bring their own oil. And it seems like, okay, but in the context of this kingdom of heaven, this is a serious thing now. Jesus is telling a story to kind of bring people in, but at the end, it does seem kind of hard-nosed that he's not gonna give them a break, but, but they're just reaping what they have sown. And so notice here what it says in verse 10 and 11. It says, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. And so the virgins went, who were ready, they went in with him to the wedding banquet. And then that door was shut. And the other ones come, and they said, sir, sir, open the door for us. And what is his reply? He says, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. So, there on the outside, and they miss the opportunity to be a part of this whole wedding banquet because they didn't think enough, not just to be prepared, but they were counting perhaps on the fact that somebody else was gonna bail them out. It wasn't necessary for me to make all that preparation. I'm I'm gonna get in, you know, uh, somehow, We'll manage, we'll figure it out. Again, this is talking about the second coming of Jesus, not just the wedding. It's talking about the wedding of the Lamb, the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sins of the world. This is a picture of those now who in this span of waiting were still prepared and found themselves in a position to be welcomed into this kingdom while those were on the outside and their response was, what they received was a response that said, I, I don't know you. Does that sound familiar to you too? You remember that time when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he said that you have to watch out for those who come to you dressed as lambs, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. He says, by their fruit, you're gonna know them. And he says, they're gonna come and they're gonna say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And he's gonna say, depart from me because I never knew you. In other words, you're not a part now of this gathering. And it wasn't that he chose to exclude them, they excluded themselves. When the time came for them to demonstrate a readiness, they came up short. And so why is Jesus telling them this story? Well, notice how he ends it here in verse 13. He says, therefore keep watch, because you don't know the day or the hour.
So it's how do you deal with weight? How do you deal with the fact that it's not happening as quickly as you would like? People could lose interest. And as a result, we just stop trying. We stop paying attention. I mean, it's a silly little story, but in the context of this whole great period of judgment that Jesus is talking about, there's nothing funny about it. He's sitting here talking to his disciples, warning them of the ravages of war that are coming. Not only is he gonna lose his life in another day, because this is coming to the end of Holy Week, he's gonna be flogged and mocked and crucified. So it's not just a silly story. It's a story that's trying to get them ready and recognize it's not gonna happen on your time schedule, but it is going to happen. And so you have to live out your life being ready because you have been called for a particular purpose. And sometimes Jesus uses these stories for just people to put their guards down and then to listen, they get drawn into the story, but the punchline is, listen, you have to keep watch. Don't let the time get away from you. Don't, don't lull yourself to the page to the point where you think that this really isn't that important because you could find yourself on the outside looking in. And so then, what's the real significant point then of this whole text? See, I like to think that how we deal with weight is going to have everything to do that with the fact that we're anticipating that it's not going to happen on our time schedule. That Jesus is saying to his disciples, listen, I don't know the day or the hour. It could be sudden. It's going to be unexpected. Don't allow yourself to think that it's not coming, though. Because remember, he just used the example of Noah in the previous couple of verses. He talked about how in the days of Noah, it was the same thing. People, they weren't prepared either. But when it started raining, I think it got their attention. So here's a coming day of, of great despair and he's using the story to say, are you, are you anticipating? Are you, are you keeping your mind open to remembering why you're here? Those foolish handmaidens, they forgot while they were, what they were really there for. How about you and me? Because this is a story about being ready for the coming of Jesus. And it may not be happening as quickly as we want, but if we're anticipating it, the other side of that is, are you remembering then why you're here? Because there's a thousand and one distractions. It could come from work or relationship issues. There's a, there's a number of ways in which you could just play these buying games with yourself and the next thing you know, God's agenda is over on this side and you're over on this side. And what if he comes that day? Are you gonna find that your jar is empty? Unprepared? When you were called to be light in the world, let your light shine. So we, we live every day with this sense of anticipation that today could be the day that Jesus comes back. But we also live each day with the recognition that we are being called to fulfill this mandate that God has put on our life. Every day to make the attempt, right, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. And every day then you get up 
with the awareness that I'm being called to fulfill the responsibilities that God has given to me. And that means who you are when nobody's looking. That, that means that I, I'm showing up every single day to, to live out my life so that my Father in heaven would look down and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Do you live like that? It's one thing to anticipate his coming, right? Like, oh, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. But when he comes back, is your cup going to be full? Because notice the severe judgment. They, they're not in. They're out. Jesus basically is saying that your actions demonstrated that you really didn't want to be a part of this family. The other ones fulfill their responsibilities. And they were invited to the party. You see, I read this story And I just imagine sitting on, in an open field and Jesus is just teaching his disciples privately, getting them ready for what is going to be a horrendous couple of days. You do recall, right, they're gonna be in hiding. They're gonna be afraid. Some of them are gonna deny him. They're all gonna scatter. But when he resurrects, Jesus offers them grace again and says, you haven't forgotten what I told you, right? Is your cup full? You remember why I called you? Are you aware of the purpose that I have given to you in this world? That's the story. That's going to be your story. Because one day he is coming back like a thief in the night, sudden and unexpected. May he find you with your cup full. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for your grace. We need to be reminded constantly We need to um, reflect on the moments that you have given to us in this life. Opportunities, Lord, to let our light shine that men may see our good work and glorify you, our Father in heaven. Moments to choose your will. Opportunities to do good opportunities to forgive and be forgiven. I pray, Father, that that this hope that we have, that one day we will be with you, that all of this life as we know it will one day be redeemed, that the brokenness that is within us and in the world around us will one day be healed, no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears. And that hope that lies within us would be enough for us to anticipate that day, to fulfill our responsibilities each and every day, and to wait with endurance for that day when we will see you face to face. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.